I'm Will Brown, I'm the assistant curator here, uh, and I am really pleased to, in, to have Amanda Hunt here, um, our visiting curator this year. Um, get this thing right. I was fortunate enough to meet Amanda while in graduate school, one year behind her, at the cur curatorial practice program at California College of the Arts in San Francisco. Since then, I've followed her work closely, and I'm grateful for her example, her very collaborative nature. We had a great time walking around the museum today. It's really fun to show your old colleagues and friends the places you've worked after you've met them a number of years ago. Um, and I'm really thankful for the generous advice she has given me over the last few years. Amanda is currently the associate curator at the Studio Museum in Harlem, where she's organized excellent exhibitions inside and outside of the galleries and runs a visiting artist program or a residency program. Her work has included exhibitions with Rashad Newsom, Lorraine O'Grady, Kevin Beasley, Simone Lee, Corey Newkirk, Rudy Shepard, and a number of others. Before her time at the Studio Museum, Amanda was curator at LAX Art from 2011 to 2014, where she led two major initiatives, including the Pacific Standard Time Performance and Public Art Festival and Made in LA 2012 which was the first biennial organized by the Hammer Museum. Amanda has also curated an amazing exhibition with one of my favorite artists who I worked with at RISD named Stephanie Jemison, and she introduced me to Stephanie. In 2014, Amanda curated Portland 2014, a, bi a biennial of contemporary art by Disjecta Contemporary Art Center in Portland. She's been very busy in the last few years. Uh, she's held curatorial positions as part of the ninth Shanghai Biennial, the Whitechapel Gallery in London, at Friedrich Petzl Gallery in New York, at the Wattis Institute for Contemporary Arts in San Francisco, and at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Tonight, Amanda will tell us about some recent and past curatorial work and research, and she's fresh off of a fantastic trip from South Africa, which I'm really excited to hear a little bit about. Tomorrow, Amanda and I will spend time with four Cleveland-based artists, whom she selected from a really competitive group of applicants. And I want to take a moment to thank everyone who applied. Um, it was a pleasure to see representations. And yes, I went through because as a curator, it's tremendous to see so many artists in the community and see their work. Um, it's, it was great to see such excellent work being made here and nearby. And I know it was not an easy choice to select just four people from this group of close to 40. So with this, I give you our visiting curator, Amanda Hunt. And thanks so much for coming. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Will Brown, for having me. Thank you, Mocha Cleveland. Thank you, Corey, for making this possible. Thank you all for being here tonight. Um, I'm going to, as promised, kind of take you through my curatorial past and present. It's a little bit, uh, we go all over the place, so just stick with me. Um, I call this um, presentation Parsing Publics a Curatorial Perspective because I have a deep interest in art in the public realm. Uh, and I'll kind of get to that at a certain point in the presentation. Um, you'll see kind of strands of that and, and moments leading up to what has really become an essential part of my work as a curator um, all over the country. I've been privileged to be able to present work in so many places and different communities and um, engage with all kinds of people and practices. So here we go. Uh, currently, I work at the Studio Museum in Harlem, which is pictured up here. I'm going to try to use my laser pointer. Um, <clears throat> The Studio Museum was founded in 1968 as a space for black artists, specifically at that time, at a time when uh, artists of African descent were not supported in institutions, uh, publicly in galleries, in any manner or sort of exhibition spaces. Uh, it was founded by three artists who um, worked out of a loft space at 125th Street and 5th Avenue. This is the original facade and storefront. You can see it next to a liquor joint um, on 125th Street, which is as vibrant today as it was in 68, I'm sure. Uh, 
it moved to, this is our mission statement, the building moved to what is our current kind of iteration of the museum, a former bank building in 1982. It was retrofitted and built out by African-American uh, architect named J. Max Bond Jr., who, I'll keep a long story short, um, was really a mentor and a predecessor to David Adjay, who will be building our new building, forthcoming uh, at the same site. We've just initiated a capital campaign for the museum uh, as we move into our 50th anniversary. So big, exciting things coming down the pipeline. So founded in 1968, uh, the Studio Museum is the nexus for artists of African descent locally, nationally, and internationally, uh, and for work that is inspired and influenced by black culture. So at this stage in 2016, we've really expanded our purview and the kind of community of artists that we support, but it's always located uh, in the the essential form, which is to support work by artists of color. Uh, and it's something that we are proud to do in the museum throughout our education departments, throughout our public programs departments, uh, and through, as Will mentioned, our artist in residency program. That was also kind of an essential part of the museum in its nascent stages. Uh, some of our or earliest artists and residents were people like David Hammonds, uh, William T. Williams, really an incredible roster of people that, um, in terms of contemporary and present makers, include Wangechi Mutu, um, Kehinde Wiley, huge names, uh, people who we have recognized for their talent and ability at a very early stage uh, in their formation as artists and who go on to do incredible things. Um, pictured here is the class of 2015, 16. Um, from left, Jordan Castile. In the center, Khalil Huffman. And on the right, EJ Hill. Each very different practices. Uh, and as part of managing the program of the artist in residence, um, we're really, we work very closely together. They have an 11 month period with us at the museum, physically in the space. Our offices are on the second floor. The artists and residents are on the third floor. We see them getting coffee um, and kind of running around the halls in between making and producing their work. And um, it's an incredible kind of journey for everyone. So this class in particular, uh, I feel very close to. I was newer to the museum right about the time that they were coming in and, and we got to um, really expand and grow together. Uh, I'll show you a couple of images. This is a painting by Jordan Castile, uh, the woman pictured in the last slide. And this is an image of Charles, who is a seasonal vendor on 125th Street. As I mentioned, and I don't know, have any of you been to the Studio Museum in Harlem? I gotta take the survey at the beginning of every talk. Thank you. Keep coming back. And for those of you who have not been, come see us. Um, Harlem is a very special place. It has always been. It was really, uh, at the turn of the century, a mecca for black people in this country, um, coming from the deep south, uh, escaping all kinds of um, trials and tribulations, racism, um, and it kind of endures in that spirit today. But it's also a very vibrant um, alternative economy on 125th Street. It is lined, the whole block is lined with people selling hats, incredible things that they have made, beaded necklaces from Kenya, uh, you can find anything and everything there. Um, so what Jordan did when she first entered the studio uh, was asked me if anyone had painted these vendors on 125th Street, and I said no, and that sounds incredible. Jordan's practice is really rooted in painting black men as a black female um, to show nuance and subtlety and a spectrum of experience um, and of personality. You can see that beautifully expressed in the color palette that she uses. Charles is kind of yellow. She uses greens, purples, any kind of um, arrangement of, of color to kind of get at the core of the person, of the sitter. So Jordan really established a community for herself during her time at the museum. Jor uh, not Jordan, excuse me, Khalil. Um, you can see all kinds of things in his studio. I'm just going to show you before and after. Khalil works in video and uh, uh, poetry and in writing. It's kind of where he came out of in his practice. So what 
Khalil ended up creating was an incredible layered installation. It was two-dimensional photography. It was a six-channel video with a script, uh, which was actually a poem that Khalil had written, kind of all ruminating on the black experience, his own experience moving through Harlem, moving through New York City. Um, and so this was a thread that became really present and evident uh, in putting this exhibition together. I should back up and say that at the end of the 11-month period that the artists and residents have at the museum, they get an exhibition, um, which opens in July, and hundreds of people come to see it. There's a lot of pressure and expectation, and every artist every year feels it. It's a really exciting time. It's when we get to share with the world what they've been working on for the last 11 months uh, in the space of the studio museum. So Khalil kind of blew everyone away with this installation. And then EJ, a uh, performance artist by training, I guess you could say, um, started with a series of drawings. Um, EJ has been obsessed with the roller coaster for a long, long time. And when he entered that white walled space and had no idea what to do, what to make for this exhibition, what to do in the studio for his residency, um, he started kind of drawing this roller coaster obsessively and ended up building it um, at a large scale. This is um, the mezzanine gallery. This is kind of the eastern portion. It's a long portion of the gallery where the artist in residency show was. Um, and that's EJ there on the platform. He performed on that platform, laying kind of statically every day that the museum was open for the duration of the exhibition. So that means 512 hours EJ logged, um, four days a week, sometimes nine hours a day. And basically, if you think of the roller coaster as a metaphor for a human experience, high highs, low lows, um, that's what EJ was really trying to capture, and I think he did beautifully. But also, as a black queer man, um, thinking about you know, the trials that he endures on a daily basis. And really the, um, the, the point of that performance was that he got up every day. So that was an incredible way that we stretched the museum um, and our audiences. Um, it was an incredible experience this year working with that group of residents. I'm just gonna bring us up to the present. Uh, this is an exhibition that we opened a few weeks ago, actually, while in South Africa. Um, this is an exhibition that's called The Window and the Breaking of the Window that I just curated. And it's on the, um, the reasons in which a lot of communities of color and white communities are coming together in action and in protest. Um, I think we can kind of use Eric Garner as that beginning point as Black Lives Matter and that movement um, as a way of thinking about you know, what we've seen in the civil rights era as something that's more contemporary, as issues um, that have not disappeared, that have affected our communities for a very long time. So what I've done is used work from our collection and um, pho pho photographs by uh, Devin Allen, a Baltimore-based artist um, who documented the Baltimore uprising and Black Lives Matter movement uh, kind of in that space and time in 2014 and 15 um, in the space as well. So come see them. They'll be up for the next few months. Um, now I'm going to kind of bring us back to the beginning of my story at the Studio Museum. I mentioned we have a collection. There are over 2,200 objects and works of art in our collection. We've been collecting, I'd say, since the late 70s. It's a very eclectic kind of mix of things. We have a range of media, photography, drawing, uh, sculpture, of course. Everything's kind of represented in that space. And when I first got to the museum, Thelma Golden, our incredible director and chief curator, said, welcome. You have a show in six months. Good luck. Um, no, she's much kinder than that, but really, I did have to make a show in six months. So what every curator does at the Studio Museum is starts in the permanent collection as a way to kind of familiarize oneself, um, really learn kind of the tenets of the museum, the real values uh, that are represented in, in that collection. So. I was totally blown away as someone who's been going to museums as long as I can remember and 
you know, even before that, um, that I got to see so many people of color represented in this collection. It was just incredible. There were busts, there were paintings, um, there were all kinds of representations of people who I've known and are in my family, and I wanted to make a show that kind of acknowledged and honored that. So my first show at the museum, <coughs> excuse me, I'm getting over a cold, uh, was called In Profile Portraits from the Permanent Collection. Um, and an excerpt from the text was, uh, throughout history, people of African descent have rarely been afforded complex identities, and until more recently, their lives remained largely undocumented. The portraits contained in the museum's collection exist as primary examples of the black community having agency in its own representation. In profile is both an affirmation of black members of our society who have contributed to various facets of American life, medicine, industry, art and culture, and represents those who have gone unnamed in ledgers and history books. And I think looking back on this, just kind of talking to you now, in the year of 2016, when we've opened in the National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, D.C., it's part of the Smith Smithsonian um, institutions. Um, Carrie James Marshall has an incredible solo exhibition that's up at the Met Breuer right now. The next time you go to New York and visit us, please also go visit them. Um, an incredible shift has already happened in two years. We're seeing so many more artists of colors and so many um, platforms, and it's, it's an incredible time. And I hope that we only keep expanding from there. This is an installation view from in profile. You can see an Allison Saar uh, bust in the front, um, a Lynette Yudum Boyachi painting in pink kind of in the background, a uh, Sedu Kieta photograph on the left, Micheline Thomas, Henry Taylor. Um, so I had a lot of fun mixing and matching all kinds of things from the collection. The bust that I mentioned that unfortunately I don't have a detailed shot of, is by Augusta Savage, who is a contemporary of Jacob Lawrence, um, a black woman working in 1926, who ran an artist workshop in Harlem and was working um, what looks like in bronze, but was actually in plaster, because at the time she did not have the money to access those kinds of materials. An incredible craftsperson, um, an incredible hand. Uh, it's a portrait of Dr. Willie Pickens Junior, who was one of the founding members of the NAACP. So again, all of this history kind of caught up in our collection that I was so excited to excavate was kind of the foray that I made into the museum. Uh, one of my next projects that is very near and dear to my heart is a project of Lorraine O'Grady's work. Lorraine is 82 this year. She is a force. That is her behind the double frame gleaming. Um, Lorraine had a whole series of lives before she got to art making in her 40s. She worked as a rock critic for Rolling Stone. Um, she was a translator for the CIA. She ran some kind of independent business, I mean, nine lives, um, and in her 40s found her way to visual art. So this is an image of um, Lorraine within the context of her performance piece, Art Is. And what is left of the, uh, the performance now are a series of 40 images that Lorraine herself has ordered kind of in a sequence. They're always meant to be shown in a certain way. Um, for the first time, I think since they've been shown, I hung them as uh, a singular line to kind of evoke the uh, parade, kind of the, the way of working through uh, a, as a parade would. Um, so the background really for this piece is that every year in Harlem since I believe 1969, so around the same time, 68, 69, revolutionary time, a lot of cultural institutions in the city are kind of galvanizing to create a more diverse landscape in arts and culture. Um, the African American Day Parade was started in Harlem. It begins at 110th at the top of Central Park and ends at about 136th and I think Lenox Avenue, and everybody's there. The cops are there with their marching team, there's unions from the city, there's step teams that come in from Atlanta at this point. I mean, it's a whole celebration, it's a day in September. Um, and so this is Lorraine with her parade float in the 1983 
uh, African American Day Parade. Um, and this was all started because of a conversation that Lorraine had with a colleague. And I'll just kind of, I won't read the whole thing, but basically what Lorraine wanted to do um, was expose the largest number of black people that she could imagine to art through her uh, performance. And so it all began with um, a conversation she had with a woman who said that avant-garde art doesn't have anything to do with black people. This made Lorraine furious. So this was what got her going. Uh, this is what drove her to create <laughs> a frame that was 15 feet by nine feet, um, gilded like a Baroque frame that you would see in the Metropolitan Museum or any kind of classical institution. And what it did, um, and what she did along with 15 other performers who she solicited from the back of you know, the Village Voice by calling up friends, these were actors and dancers, not visual artists really, um, just people kind of interested in what Lorraine was creating. Um, what it did was simultaneously framed Harlem. So you can see the architecture of Harlem, uh, that's the Renaissance ballroom in the background, which was torn down in 2015, um, shortly after I got to Harlem. This was a space, uh, it was a dance hall, it was a music venue, it was a real space for socialization for the Harlem community that was torn down for development, uh, which is rampant in all kind of aspects of New York City, but it also framed um, the people. So this is one of Lorraine's kind of performers interacting with another member of the parade, probably in a float and an organization behind them. Uh, these are some of the bystanders. So basically, the work is titled Art is Ellipsis, ambiguously so that art is everything. Art is everyone. Art is whatever you finish that sentence with. And Lorraine told me, um, kind of in the space of an interview, as we were leading up to the show, she didn't know if people would get it. And she described kind of getting out there with the performers and starting to roll up Adam Clayton Powell. And she said that one woman said, that's right, baby, I'm the art. And she knew it worked. She knew that the piece was successful. She knew that people could feel um, engaged with her performance and could actively be creating art with her. So now I'm going to go further back. Um, as Will mentioned, I was a curator at LAX Art for three years in Los Angeles. LAX Art was, is, uh, a nonprofit space that was founded in 2005, so they've just turned a decade old. Um, this is the original building in which I worked. And this was really um, the period right after graduate school, uh, and it was my introduction to public art. So this is the facade of LAX Art. This is a Carl Handel drawing. Uh, that's on the building facade. And part of uh, what LAX Art did and does is incorporates art in every crevice. I mean, literally every crevice imaginable. In a window, there was a mini gallery. Uh, we used all of the spaces. So this kind of introduced me to the possibility that you could put art everywhere. Uh, and I've been doing so ever since. One of my favorite and um, more personal projects was this um, really well integrated uh, photo kind of collage that Carter Mull made. And you can barely tell that it's not a part of the landscape in downtown Los Angeles. Carter is a photographer who has a studio on 11th Street in the Fabric District, um, kind of similar to 125th Street, vibrant people selling things, all kinds of activities happening. Um, and what he wanted to do, what we wanted to do, was create a piece that felt really well situated and integrated, um, so much that it hasn't been taken down. And this was put up three years ago. So it still remains there today. And I think, I know that part of the joy for me in working in the public is just that uh, you can happen upon it. It doesn't need to be an intentional experience where you're consciously going to Mocha Cleveland today. You're just going to drive by and have something happen to you. Um, that was a lot of fun to experiment with in Los Angeles, a driving town. 
This is a billboard on the top left, uh, photographed by contemporary artist Talia Ch Chetrit, excuse me, New York based, um, another project that I got to work closely with the artist on. And this was part of another aspect of what we did in the public domain at LAX Art. So that billboard was just a couple doors down and we had a deal with Clear Channel uh, where we would get to do programming and get to invite an artist to create a work for that space for four weeks at a time, pretty much at any given point during the year. So if we got the inkling or an artist had a great proposal, we could do it and it was incredible. This is an installation shot of another project that I got to work uh, on with Anna Sue Hoy, who is a ceramicist uh, based in Los Angeles. This is kind of the final product. Um, this is called the Look See. It's situated in Kings Park in West Hollywood, um, where LAX Art had a great relationship with the city of West Hollywood, and we would get to use different parks and kind of pockets of that part of town to produce public artwork. Um, this is a work by Sam Falls, who is a photographer and sculptor. Basically, um, this is a sculpture that really is rooted in, in the principles of photography. Uh, as it is exposed to light, the color changes slowly over time. So this is another installation that we were able to leave up for a year in the city of West Hollywood and just see how people responded to and engaged with the work. Next scene, Portland. Um, I worked on, I had the great pleasure of, of going to Portland, Oregon for the first time in my life. Um, while working in Los Angeles, um, I was invited to curate a biennial of contemporary art uh, with a contemporary art space based there. And they wanted someone with fresh eyes to kind of come onto the scene and be able to create something there. Um, Will and I were talking earlier, I know Michelle Grabner and Jens Hoffman will be producing a triennial here. Michelle Grabner was one of the subsequent curators of this biennial, so look back into the archives and see what different things we did. Um, but what I was able to do was look through hundreds of submissions, online submissions. I did, I think I looked through 300. I think I went to 65 or so studios uh, across the state and kind of distilled it down to 15 artists and collaboratives, um, you know, more experimentation and taking uh, a little bit of what I learned in LA to Portland. So this is an installation shot within Disjecta, the Contemporary Art Center um, that hosted me for the biennial. This is a collaboration uh, between Kelly Rauer, the artist, and a few, this is actually Kelly uh, replicated in all the images. It was an incredible video installation of um, time-based movement. She comes out of dance and it was just a beautiful kind of expression of, of that medium. And then this is a larger installation shot in the next gallery of uh, several different artists. On the left, another artist collaborative, um, Modu Dieng, who is a Dakar-born, Portland-based uh, teacher at the Pacific Northwest College of Arts, uh, a collaboration that he made with a student of his, Devin Maldonado, uh, basically a billboard made for the interior. And you'll see, I go back outside again, don't worry. Um, and then some other artists who were more kind of established, uh, D.E. May in the back, uh, conceptual artist, excuse me, and Blair Saxon Hill in the front, and Jessica Jackson Hutchins, um, who made a lot of kind of, a lot of mess. It was really beautiful. So if you remember that interior billboard, we also made exterior. I wanted to see what happened in Portland, Oregon, where everybody rides bicycles, yes, but they also drive a lot of cars. Uh, you do have to use a car to get around. So I wanted to see how the billboard would function in that public space. So I did a series of billboards there as well. There were three. Um, Devin and Moju's was, you can see it in better detail here, but basically this was um, a portrait of the barber shop. There's a large black community in Portland, Oregon, um, and gentrification, again, it kind of butts up against it. And I wanted to be able to talk to that community and involve that community in what was happening in terms of the biennial. So Devin and Modu made a series of images and then made this kind of composite collage uh, that you see here in the billboard. 
another uh, billboard was by uh, old school artist Richard Thompson, who comes out of a more modernist painterly aesthetic, uh, but they're strange modernist paintings, and I loved them. Uh, Richard's been painting the Oregon landscape for probably 40 years through different seasons, through different spaces and different light. And so I wanted to reflect the Portland landscape back to the community um, in, a, in a kind of clever way. And then the last one uh, by another artist, painter, multimedia artist, we'll call him, Ralph Pugai, uh, of Filipino descent, who created um, a billboard called Baby Coughing um, as kind of a response and a comment uh, in a more personal way to what was happening, to the changes reflected in, in the Portland landscape and creative community as a result of just, you know, the economy and things shifting. Uh, another public project that I did was with yet another collaborative, um, Kristen, Christopher Micklig and John Zerzan. Uh, John Zerzan is an anarchist writer and had never made visual art in his life. And he and Christopher had a very interesting history. They had met probably 15 years earlier when Christopher was a student at the University of Oregon, uh, where they both now teach and finally we're able to come back together and do something uh, for the biennial. So what you see is um, one of three kiosks. The project was called Kiosk, Kiosk, Kiosk. It was sited at three different parks throughout the city. And it's uh, a reference to a certain kind of architecture, but also the kiosk as a billboard, as a way of sharing information. And what you can see um, just subtly is text that was imprinted on one side of this plywood structure. And these were writing selections that John had chosen for the pieces. And it ranged from, you know, critique on capitalism to poetry by Rilke. And it was kind of on the, uh, you know, passerby to stop and reflect or in some cases damage. And this does happen in public art. Um, but to really kind of engage with them. So I was pleased with how that all kind of turned out in Portland. It was a great experience. So now I'm yanking us back to New York. Um, another show that's kind of near and dear to me that um, felt really important to kind of be able to situate myself in Harlem, in New York, um, but also in the present was a show, a constellation um, that was 26 artists eight from our permanent collection, and the remaining 18, uh, all contemporary artists, peers who I know who are working uh, in a way that either responds to a certain legacy of art making. Um, again, David Hammonds, we have to mention, Elizabeth Catlett, certainly, um, Adrian Piper, who you'll see later, and just kind of draw some comparisons to um, what was then 2015, uh, a reflection of where have we come from and where are we going a little bit. I wanted to establish an intergenerational dialogue um, between some of the old heads, um, people that we admire greatly and really look up to and in some cases emulate, um, such as those that I mentioned. But, um, you know, as, as uh, people in a, a newer generation, how are we responding to and reflecting some of the same issues? So for Elizabeth Catlett and David Hammonds responding to the civil rights movement, how in 2015 uh, does that get reflected in the space of art making now? Um, this is a site-specific wall painting by Torquase Dyson uh, called Stranger Fruit. Um, it was, Torquase is incredible. Basically what she does is maps out spaces. So. The final painting that you're looking at has considered this kind of low alcove gallery in which it was situated. So the lines that you see, kind of the absent um, spaces, are a reflection of the track lighting, kind of the lines that are drawn in that way. It's very, it's quite literally site specific. It's very specific to that space and kind of situating you there. Um, and each of these white dots represents a body. Um, there's a psychology to Torquase's conceptual practice. And of course, Stranger Fruit, Strange Fruit 
refers to lynchings. So this was a way of documenting a fraction of lynchings that happened over a period of time starting in the 1800s in America. And this is part of a larger project of Turquoise. So again, in 2015, how are we kind of working through traumas, working through histories, working through um, advocating for ourselves and demanding civil liberties? Uh, this is a small, small work by a large man, Tony Lewis, Chicago-based artist, wonderful artist, um, again, another peer, who is always working through language. This is a Calvin and Hobbes uh, cartoon kind of snippet that he has obscured with graphite pencil, um, obfuscated with uh, white kind of correction tape. And he's, you know, taken some of the words out so that the essence remains, make his mouth bigger, angrier. And if you think of certain representations of black men, of which Tony is, um, in media and popular culture, this really resonated. This is a favorite. Um, Adrian Piper, who, grand dame of conceptual art, again, wanting to make these pairings. So Tony is someone who certainly is looking at a work by Adrian Piper, a legacy of Adrian Piper's work, and kind of situating himself in that lineage. This is in our permanent collection. Uh, Rashad Newsom, uh, which we'll now kind of move into, was another project that I was really excited to have brought to the museum. On a personal level, Rashad is someone who I've known for a decade. Um, he is an advocate of uh, the LGBT community, specifically the Vogue community. We all know Madonna popularized it in the 1990s, um, but Vogue was born in Harlem and in the South Bronx in the late 70s in a queer community of color. Um, so these are, this is a kind of split um, two-channel video, actually two videos, but I showed them as a diptych. Um, this is the old way on the left and the new way on the right. So these are kind of stylistic differences um, that are evidenced in these two video portraits that Rashad made of two Vogue queens. Um, and Rashad's been working with the Vogue community for as long as I've known him, for a decade. So this was really a way that we were able to show a small survey of his work, a decade of working within this community, um, and a decade of working towards showing this community in this form of art making uh, in the institutional space. Rashad was in the 2010 Whitney Biennial in which he showed uh, some of this work and has now gone on to do things internationally um, that has expanded the purview, certainly of this community, but of the people and audiences engaging uh, with this type of work. Part of the exhibition was an incredible video installation called Icon, um, and it's almost like a video game meets music video, again, with some of these practitioners um, that are all kind of blended into this crazy amalgamation of, of technical skills that Rashad has fine-tuned and really worked towards uh, for the decade that he's been working, uh, again, with the community, but also within the medium of video and technology. I think virtual reality is next for him. That's what I'm saying. If you haven't seen his work, you have to look at it. <clears throat> I'm going to take a pause for water. Are you all still with me? OK. Um, this We're looking at a map of Harlem now. Um, another thing that kind of came to my attention when I first joined the Studio Museum in 2014 <coughs> pardon me, was that we were building towards our 50th anniversary and what that would mean to the institution, to the identity, and what we wanted to create in the next 50 years. And that is taking the shape and form of a new building, as I mentioned, that will be built by David Adjay, the architect of the NMAAHC in Washington, D.C., an incredible building. Um, so we're honored to, to have such greatness kind of building this next chapter for us. But also, what does that mean for the museum at a period where it will be in flux? And what does that mean for a museum that talks about its community in the title of the museum? We are the Studio Museum in Harlem. So what does that mean uh, moving forward? So what that means to me moving forward um, 
is creating work in the public space, of course. I've just kind of drawn out a long history, or maybe not so long, of working in public space. So when I first kind of realized that we would be moving outside of the walls of the museum, I wanted to look to go back to this map um, of the landscape of Harlem, you know, what, what was there and what kind of public spaces I could use. So what you're looking at that has started on this little Google map um, are the four historic Harlem parks. They're part of the network of New York City parks and are protected by the city and are managed by a historic Harlem parks manager. Um, they're incredible spaces. Uh, Morningside Park is the southernmost that kind of butts up against Columbia University. Um, it's at about one-tenth and goes all the way up to 100 and, oh gosh, 20th about. Marcus Garvey Park on the kind of also lower portion of this map is a block away from our museum. Uh, and then St. Nicholas Park and Jackie Robinson are the upper reaches of Harlem. So what I was able to do uh, uh, was invite four artists and commissioned new works by each of them. So it was Rudy Shepard, Simone Lee, Kevin Beasley, and Corey Newkirk. And each of those artists has a deep relationship and history with the museum, either as artists in residence or as exhibiting artists. And if you're either, you're kind of family. Um, so I really wanted to draw from that community uh, when thinking about putting uh, art in a public space, because they knew the community, they knew the landscape, and they knew our institution um, in really meaningful ways. So this is an image of Rudy Shepard. Uh, this is the Black Rock Negative Energy Absorber in Jackie Robinson Park. Uh, that's a couple blocks from my house. And then <clears throat> behind it is a recreation center and a public pool that's heavily used in the summer. Um, it's an incredible space. It's really alive day and night. Uh, and this is part of, this work is part of a series of Black Rock negative energy absorbers. The kind of impetus for the work for Rudy was not to think about art as a means for change, ironically. I think some people scoff at you know what art has the potential to do or to change. Uh, but I think us art lovers in the room, us artists in the room know, know the potential and are pushing that potential all the time. So not ironically, Rudy wanted to explore what it meant to create something that would absorb the negative energy in the world. So what he's done in this iteration that's new, you can kind of see there's a little pocket that a person can kind of situate themselves in and maybe get absorbed from. Um, it's been a really fun experimentation. This is an image from another performance uh, with another version of the Black Rock Negative Energy Absorber where Rudy, uh, the artist himself, performs as the healer um, to kind of animate and activate and inaugurate uh, the healing device. So it's, it's part of a larger series and it's incredible. The next uh, artist commission uh, is Kevin Beasley. This is in Morningside Park. This is Who's Afraid of Red, Black, and Green, which is also the title of an incredible uh, large, ugh, large monochromatic painting by Carrie James Marshall, which you can see on View at the Met Boyer now. You would think I would work for them. I keep mentioning them, but it's a very important show. Um, so this work references that these are all um, satellite dish size, these are eight foot in diameter. These are pretty massive pieces. This is resin covered clothing sourced from a secondhand store in East Harlem uh, that Kevin frequented actually long before he got to the Studio Museum as an artist in residence in 2013. His aunts have shopped there. There's a family history there. Um, so there's an ongoing relationship that Kevin has and so he sourced house dresses and kind of different t-shirts and all kinds of things um, within a certain color scheme, dipped those in a quick drying resin and then arranged them really beautifully on these dishes. So they each kind of sit in their little space in Morningside Park in a very quiet kind of contemplative area. You can see in that last slide, people sunbathing. It's too cold now, but they live for that park and sunbathing. Um, and we're really pleased with how that came out as well. 
I mentioned that Marcus Garvey Park is kind of the closest to the museum. Um, and this is where Simone Lee has situated three imbas. Um, these are three kind of hybridized hut-like structures that take from Zimbabwean architecture, um, from the Musgum mud huts uh, that she referenced a lot in, in sourcing the images for this. Um, they also are really beautifully um, Simone's sculptures. Simone is primarily a sculptor. Uh, she also has made videos and incorporated performance in a lot of her installations. Uh, but at the end of the day, she really knows how to use her hands beautifully. So these imbas kind of took the shape of Simone's pottery, of, of her ceramics, and um, just at a larger scale. You can see, if you look more closely, those are thatch roofs. Um, and I'll make another long story short, this kind of tied in really beautifully. Um, Marcus Garvey is another park that is used heavily by its community on all kind of corners. Um, and there's a real diaspora represented there. So one day we're kind of coming down to the wire, trying to figure out thatching with another kind of contractor working on the job. It did not work out in the end. And there were two men who walked by one day and they said, do you need help? And we were like, yes. Um, what, what do you possibly know about what we're doing? They were like, we're from Burkina Faso, and we actually do this all the time. Can we help you? So in a really beautiful way, um, we, we represented the African diaspora in, in the concept of these imbas and also in the making of them. And the final kind of, oh, I popped this in just to show you, sorry, a little bit of uh, source imagery. This is a Zimbabwean hut. You can see the thatch roofing. There's an incredible um, style and kind of um, history for, for making these types of structures that Simone wanted to honor and kind of make her own. Oop, I got too far ahead of myself. This is, oh, what happened? This is Corey Newkirk. This is um, the fourth artist in the fourth park, uh, St. Nicholas Park. It was um, a kind of coming home for Corey. Corey's been based in Los Angeles for the last, I want to say, 20 years. He's now a teacher at USC. Uh, he attended CalArts and you know made his life and career there. But he was born in the Bronx. And that street that you can see um, from the top of the stairwell uh, where his installation is, um, he used to ride up and down with his stepmother as a child. So he kind of has a personal memory and attachment to that space. And that's something that I didn't know at the time, but I did try to be conscious of in pairing these artists with their locations, um, just that there might be some kind of connection there. And, and a lot of them ended up being serendipitous. Uh, but this work is called Centra. It is three um, steel rod structures that hold up. You can see kind of this diaphanous um, material, these curtains. It's basically, if any of you have ever been behind the scenes at a restaurant or worked in a restaurant, refrigerator, you know, those vinyl door things, that's what that is. So Corey has an incredible ability to take the most normal, mundane material and make it glorious. Um, it all kind of began from a series of photo collages that he was making. Um, this depicts downtown Los Angeles, but it was something that I saw in an exhibition in Los Angeles when we were kind of walking through, and I said, can we make this in Harlem? Um, so we did. Abruptly, that is my last slide. I thought there was one more image, but I hope you all have kind of gotten a sense of what I love doing, uh, which is working with artists and creating impossible things wherever we can. Um, and at this point, I would welcome any questions that you have. If you have questions, just raise your hand and I'll come grab you. Okay. Oh, yes, sir. <coughs> Hi, my name is Randy, nice and I have a uh, photography studio and art gallery on the east side of Cleveland. Okay. And it's been in existence since May. I've had three. I'm on my third uh, exhibit. 
And one of the things that I'm finding uh, difficult uh, to do is to get black folks to come and look at black art. Uh -huh. And I was just wondering if you could uh, provide any insight on that. Sure. Um, it's something, it's what we've called, are we still rolling on YouTube? Sure are. Mm. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's live. Now we're going behind the scenes to the community hall. Um, it's something that we think about a lot and have historically because it's not enough that we're on 125th Street in Harlem sometimes. I've, you know, I talk to anybody and everybody, uh, people who have lived in Harlem all their lives who have never been inside that space that I try to make feel welcome or just let it be known that like we exist and they should be there. So. I think it can come in any shape and form, and it's kind of like play to your strengths in that way. I imagine that as someone who started a gallery in a space for creativity and socializing, that you have a natural ability to reach out to people. So if that's through other community leaders, if that's through schools, if that's literally through flyering on the streets, like whatever you think might be the most effective in communicating that art is for everyone, to go back to Lorraine O'Grady. I think um, it's a challenge for a lot of people, you know? They, they see a certain space. I mean, this building is gorgeous, but I'm sure for people who don't know the art world or don't feel as comfortable in it, um, it can be an intimidating space. So to acknowledge that, but really to do it on a personal level, and I think sometimes it's just as simple as talking to anyone and everyone, um, using Facebook, using social media, and just trying to figure out what rhythm is the most impactful in your community. Well, again, I'm still trying to figure it out. Yeah. So one of the things is I've been to galleries and museums all over the world. Sure. And when I look at the uh, current exhibit that I have up, which features the work of nine African-American painters, yes. some of this stuff is just really, from an objective point of view, yeah. is just uncanny it's unbelievable and again we're using social media as a means of trying to uh garner people you know to, to come in sure i'm old school yeah mouth, get on telephone seriously you know that kind of thing but uh i'm trying to learn the social media concept yes. as a way of uh you know promoting this uh this gallery so stay flexible and stay on it i mean it's only been open since may and these things take time oh, i realize that as yeah. So, why don't you speak into the mic and tell us where the gallery is? There you go. Oh, sure. sure. The gallery is right at, here. I yeah, like the gallery's it. at 12726 Larchmere, which is near Shaker Square, Shaker Heights, Ohio. So it's in the best location that I've ever had as a photographer. And so the places I go, you can't go you can't come at night. Yep. You have to come during the day. And Larchmere is a very um, uh, diverse uh, uh, art community, if you will. There are other uh, galleries. Wolf Gallery, if anybody is familiar with that, uh, very upscale gallery. Sure. And uh, so, you know, again, just trying to uh, make hay while the sun shines. Keep doing it. Yeah. We'll, we'll drive by tomorrow. <laughs> it's called Larchmere Arts. And if you go to Facebook and look uh, look, uh, put in large mirage, you'll see our calendar of events. Perfect. Hi, Amanda. Hi, Amanda. Uh, <laughs> I'm Amanda King. I run a youth <laughs> photography program um, for black and brown youth ages 14 to 19 here in Cleveland. And my program derived out of the police reform process and having black youth not being able to be at the proverbial decision-making table, but wanting them to share in it and to share their experiences with someone like me who is a part of decision-making. And I guess like you talked about people like Devin Allen, who's very much like a photo activist. And, um, you know, we're inundated with images every day of like black oppression mm -hmm. and suffering. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, if you're a black artist, a lot of that anger and frustration is just automatically gonna come out of you. Sure. And I was wondering, as a curator, how do you foresee um, in the future, or even now, when you put together exhibitions, how do you reflect the times, but still embody a sense of black joy? Mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah, I wish we could like do a walkthrough of my show, um, the window and the breaking of the window, because I've tried to leave space for all of that. There's a lot of painful work in there, and there's a lot of hopeful work in there. Um, I maybe I'll just go back. I don't. Hmm, this might take a minute. Can I go all the way back? Basically, what I'm trying to. Corey, can I ask you to help me? Yeah, I think it says black power, so that's hopeful. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think about this. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to create space for all of those things uh, because it's a spectrum of experience, right? There's frustration, there's sadness. You have to honor and acknowledge those things. I think that's part of how we process and how we can start to move through some of these things or at least start to um, understand some of what plagues so many of us. Um, and I think that by simply, and it's easier in my case because I work for the Studio Museum in Harlem and the mission is clear and the platform is clear and um, the opportunity is clear just by nature of like being in that space in New York City with that kind of attention and focus um, and critical insight, like that's positive. Do you know what I mean? So by allowing, um, space for exhibiting that work, that's, that's powerful, that's joyful, that's community building, and that's a way of sharing information and experience and connecting people. And I think that that's, that's enough sometimes. You know, That's a way that visual art can really be in service um, to creating opportunity and creating um, positive exchanges, you know, because there's both. And that's just the reality, and I think that to be honest with ourselves and honest with each other, we need to leave space for both. Anyone else have questions? Well, thanks so much, Amanda. Thanks for having me, everyone. Thank you. And thank you all for coming. Hope to see you again soon.